Good morning, everyone. It is now 1030. We thank you for joining us today for this webinar, a deeper dive into the district's mission of water quality. I am Jennifer Mitchell, and I am responsible for the district's educational resources. And I am so excited today that we have Dr. Margaret Guyette, who is the technical program manager for the Water Quality Monitoring Program in the Bureau of Water Resources Information. And she has been at the district for over six years. She's gonna give us a great understanding of the district's role in water quality. Just a reminder that this is our sixth of our weekly webinar series that we have been hosting to provide residents the opportunity to learn more about how they are able to help protect our water resources. This, continue, this series will continue through the summer and our next webinar will be on June 18th at the same time and we will focus on our core mission of natural systems. I hope you'll sign up for that webinar on our main website and we hope you'll join us there. Just a reminder of some of the housekeeping things. You are all on mute throughout the presentation and this webinar will be recorded and is made, will be made available on our website. So that is a good reminder that you can go and access our previous webinars in case you missed any of those and still have them as a resource for information. There is a question box that you are able to type in questions as Margaret gets up, gets to things that you may um, wanna find out more about, but we will get to those questions at the end of the presentation. And if we don't have time to address each and every question that does come in, we will directly email you with the answer to those questions. So with that, um, I'm gonna start with just a little bit of a district overview of um, the fact that the St. John's River Water Management District is one of the five water management districts here in the state of Florida. And it is our mission to ensure that we have enough water for us, the people of our district, our businesses, and our natural systems. And so in order to accomplish that overarching mission, we have four core missions that everything we do falls under one of these core missions or multiple. Those are water supply, which we heard about last week with our executive director, Dr. Ann Shortell, water quality, which we will discuss today, natural systems, which we'll be talking about next week, so please tune in for that, as well as flood protection, which will be the last week in June. Uh, water quality is the topic that we are discussing today, and that takes a lot of different um, directions that it can go. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Margaret and let her tell you what exactly water quality is and how you can help to under, or how it can help you understand what's going on in the water with you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. So yes, that fundamental question, what is water quality is really very important. And so in sum, it's the chemical, physical and biological characteristics of water. And so what we mean by chemical characteristics is things like nutrients or metals, so chemicals in the water, um, but perhaps not necessarily negative chemicals. Physical characteristics are things like water temperature or the clarity of the water, how clear it is. And then biological characteristics are, of course, organisms in the water, one of the big hot topics most recently um, where biological characteristics are really important is with algal blooms, which I'll definitely be touching on as I go forward into this. So when we talk about water quality, one of the questions that we often hear is, let me see whether I can advance the slide. What makes water quality good or bad? Well, it really depends on what you're interested in. And so if you're interested in drinking water, you're probably going to need to find out from some sort of regulatory agency like the Environmental Protection Agency or the, Depart the Florida Department of Health about whether that water is okay to drink. But if you're interested in fishing, you might have completely different standards around what you care, yeah, about, what because you care about because you're actually because interested. You're actually in inter I apologize, I'm getting some serious feedback here. Uh, because you're actually interested in whether the fish are healthy and also whether potentially you may want to consume those fish. Perhaps you you are interested in, and I apologize again, I am struggling with getting this to advance. 
There we go. Perhaps you're interested in recreating a bit. Maybe you want to go kayaking or you want to go swimming with your family. And at that point, what's considered good or bad is really, okay, you're actually interacting directly with the water itself. You might be want, want to be in, immersed in it. And so you might be concerned about what could be detrimental to, to your health in, in that water. And so we've got a lot of agencies in the state that play a large role in this. And we end up cooperating a lot when we're dealing with um, considering the quality of our water. And so the Department of Health Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the Department of Environmental Protection all end up working together to kind of help uh, address various water quality issues and maybe the best resource depending on what your questions are. So for drinking water, you may wanna be talking to Department of Health. For fish health, you may be wanting to talk about Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So there are lots of different resources that we as a state have available to people. So we here at the district are particularly interested in, I'm going to highlight four main um, uh, issues that we, we are particularly interested in. And one of them actually ties into to next week's focal um, uh, mission, which is a uh, core mission that, will be, that uh, Dr. Marzolf will be presenting on, and that's the natural systems in, in our district. And so really, um, it's very important to us that we protect our natural systems and, and restore them in some cases. And um, often water quality can play a pretty active role in that. Another important one is nutrient reduction. That's especially important given the large population we have in Florida and the uh, very large agricultural economy that we have here in Florida. And so um, you can imagine that nutrients can be an issue when you have a lot of people and there is waste that is produced by those people. So um, waste water, uh, among other wastes. And uh, um, in addition, we manage our own properties often by um, managing our lawns and perhaps uh, fertilizing our lawns. And so, um, so sometimes we need to play a role in figuring out ways to reduce our own nutrient input into our water systems. And then of course our agricultural systems, certainly they as well will use, uh, will use fertilizers. And so it's something that we need to consider and we work a lot with Department of Environmental Protection and other groups on, uh, on examining plans for nutrient reduction whenever possible and work with the growers themselves. Harmful algal blooms is one of those really hot topics that uh, has especially been important um, for those of you who may be located in the lower St. John's River uh, Basin. We had a pretty big bloom season last year with really a lot of algal blooms. And so this has been a really important topic for a lot of us really across the state to, to focus on. And we actually have a really uh, fantastic cooperative um, arrangement with the Department of Environmental Protection and Department of Health, whereby we may uh, go out and sample harmful algal blooms if they're reported to us or if we observe them. And then we send those samples to the Department of Environmental Protection's lab, and they will analyze them and let us know whether they the blooms are toxic. And if they are toxic, then that information gets passed on to the Department of Health and they would put out alerts. And so you end up having this multi-agency interaction occur in order for us to be able to get the word out about, uh, about blooms. And then the last focus I'm gonna uh, mention here is water supply protection. And this uh, ties back to what Dr. Shortell talked about last week, if you are able to join us for the first core mission webinar. And really, we have this really valuable Florida aquifer system. So the groundwater here in Florida is unique and it's very important for our water supply. And of course, as our water supply, it's also important for the quality of that water to be well-maintained and monitored. And so we as a district ensure that that's a portion of what we do as part of our water quality monitoring program. So jumping into that monitoring program, we have a pretty large program. We sample over 350 surface water monitoring stations in the district. So in this map, you can see here, there are green points that are uh, ambient monitoring or permanent monitoring. So those are the ongoing monitoring locations that we have in the district. And then the brownish color are project-based monitoring. And so those are typically associated with more time-limited projects that have a specific management focus that we are, we are working toward. 
And of course, the other side is that we have a pretty large, over 450 groundwater monitoring wells. So, um, and, and on this map, there are many of these locations will have multiple wells in one place. So you may have a well at the surficial level, at the upper Floridan aquifer, and at the lower Floridan aquifer, all to get an idea about how our entire aquifer system is doing. So we've got this pretty extensive water quality monitoring program. So in terms of getting out there and sampling, we have a large team of field samplers who, who uh, are involved in our surface water quality monitoring program, doing routine sampling in various surface water, uh, surface waters like lakes, rivers, springs, and wetlands. And we also have a group, uh, we have really one major person and some, some folks helping him at times um, doing routine sampling in wells as well, okay? So if you recall, there were 450 wells and uh, there were 350 surface water locations. Now the wells are actually only sampled once a year versus the surface water samples being sampled much more frequently. And that's because usually the quality in the water may vary a lot more in the surface water versus the wells just because of the nature of the extra fluxes of, or basically if you've got extra rain coming in or extra movement of the water, it's more likely for that water quality to change. So we, have, so we may sample monthly or every other month or quarterly on surface water versus just annually on wells. Another type of sampling that we do is uh, real-time automated sampling or continuous monitoring. And this is actually, um, uh, these are really neat deployments where we put out sensors that, um, that record data every hour. And this is really useful for certain specific projects. For example, we have a number of these deployed in the Indian River Lagoon specifically to monitor conditions related to algal blooms, since that is such a, a hot topic in that area as well. And so we have sensors on these, these units that, um, that are looking at chlorophyll, which is a, a, a essentially what we can measure to tell that algal blooms may be occurring. So if we see spikes in chlorophyll, we are likely to be seeing a, a, an algal bloom occur as well. In addition, we have oxygen monitors on there. And so sometimes you can end up seeing big declines in oxygen as a result of the algal blooms. And when those declines happen, you end up having this deprivation of oxygen for the fish. And so we can potentially see fish kills occurring. And so what we're getting with hourly data is we're able to really get much quicker feedback on what the conditions are so that we know what we may be uh, in for if the conditions are changing rapidly. And one other type of sampling that we do is uh, storm event sampling. And that's specifically for certain projects in which we may be especially interested in what might be flowing off of the land during high, uh, high flow events. So when it's uh, raining a lot, um, this can be especially important in agricultural areas where we may, uh, when, it is, uh, when it rains a lot, we may end up with extra nutrients coming off of the land, but we have ways to manage that and, uh, and uh, we have ways of then monitoring it as well to find out whether our management actions are successfully uh, uh, reducing nutrient loads off of agricultural areas. So of course, with all of those data, or all of those samples coming in, we at the district in our Palaka headquarters have a full service lab. And it's responsible for doing chemical and physical analyses. It's both internationally and nationally accredited and certified. And we collect over 6,000 water quality samples each year from all of those locations I mentioned before. And the lab is responsible for doing around 250,000 analyses each year, which is really impressive. And this is the fantastic lab team in this picture here. And kudos to them for their hard work because it's, a, it's an amazing set of data that they end up producing. So with that, I'd like to show you a communications video that was put together not too long ago that really highlights a lot of different uh, aspects of uh
The water quality data we collect is used for a number of district programs, uh, including our regulatory program, our water supply planning, our cost share program, and it's also used to uh, protect the natural systems, which is one of the district core missions. Today we're at Crescent Lake. This is a site that we sample monthly on our south monthly run. We used a churn splitter and a Kalawasi tube to take a 2.5 meter to a 0.5 meter sample. We went ahead and put that into the churn splitter and homogenized it and took our sample from that. After we had collected all of our bottles, we went ahead and filtered two eight ounce bottles and a vial. From that, we went ahead and preserved it with sulfuric and nitric acid. From the start of when we have sampled and collected our sound readings, we will have it on ice within 15 minutes. In the morning, the lab staff checks in the water samples. I prepare all the reagents and standards for the PO4 NOx analytical tests and then retrieve the collected samples from the walk-in cooler. This test measures orthophosphate and nitrite plus nitrate. This is one of the many tests being performed on the samples collected yesterday. The sample table is created to link the vial position to the data result. A series of standards and quality control samples are analyzed at the beginning of the run and throughout the run to ensure the instrument is operating within established parameters. The automated chemistry analyzer uses a robotically controlled auto sampler to process each sample quickly and efficiently. Each of these files represents a different sample from different areas of the state. The results of each measurement are entered into a validation program and then exported to our laboratory information management system. Each particular water sample is important because it provides evidence of the history of that piece of water and what's happened to it since it's fallen from the sky. The water quality information that we collect and analyze is important to the public because essentially it tells the public is the water supporting the type of environment that they like to see. Healthy fish, clear water, and supports really high quality recreation. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer, for facilitating that. So, as you can see, we have a, a pretty amazing water quality monitoring program, and what comes out of that is quite a bit of data. So this here um, is the landing page for our water quality data access, in case anybody's interested in looking at this after the, the webinar. And just so you're aware, the, uh, the, the top blue button, the continuous sensor-based water quality data, that is where you access that, that real-time automated data. And the bottom blue button, the environmental data retrieval tool, that's where you access any of our routine ambient permanent monitoring data from both groundwater and surface water. Note that some of our project-based monitoring is actually not reported through this tool. But you can contact us at this web, web address, wq at sjrwmd.com, if you're looking for certain data and you're not able to see it through one of those tools. I'm not able to advance. Oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, one of the really wonderful products that we put together uh, from this, the uh, um, all of the data that we have is a status and trends assessment. And this is a really neat product that is essentially a series of maps that summarize summarizes our water quality information. So this is again the landing page for that and you see these three uh, buttons here and each one of these will launch a different map application that can give you a little bit of information uh, about our water quality. So just to give you a little bit of background and note that that surface water, groundwater and springs are our three main groupings. I am, okay, so the water quality status uh, is essentially how is our water quality right now? Where are we at? And it's looking at basically in recent years, what, uh, what is our water quality looking like? And so we, on the maps, what you'll see and I'm struggling with getting this to advance. So Jennifer, there we go. Uh, map colors are gonna, are gonna be indicating the status. Um, and so 
the, the lighter the color, the lower the value of, of the, the parameter. And the, the darker the color, the higher the value. And what's really important to note, though, is that for surface water, the low and the high isn't relative to some sort of standard. It's actually relative to each other. So high is just means it's higher than, uh, than other locations around the district. Um, and high may not mean that it's problematic. It's just high relative to other things. Water quality trends um, indicate whether um, water quality is improving or basically how water quality may be changing over time. In this case, we're looking at a 15 year window and the map symbols are, are going to indicate the trends. So you've got triangles pointing up or down for increasing or decreasing squares for stable, circles for not enough data. And that's typically when stations were started sometime within the last 15 years and we just don't have enough information to evaluate a trend yet. The last piece is that there are these little yellow dots that show up on the triangles if there is an especially large increase or decrease uh, pr um, present with the trend. So let's take a look at that map. This is what the surface water map looks like when you first launch it. And so you can see on the left side here, we have uh, essentially a, a bunch of text that talks about what this product is, what kind of information you can get from it. And on the right is the map window. So at first we're not seeing any of those colors yet because we haven't selected one of the water quality characteristics. And so below this, uh, this first panel is actually a series of a bunch of different characteristics. So we can only see nutrients total phosphorus right now. So let's say we select that this is what it would look like. We then all of a sudden see all of those colors. So you can see the light to dark for low to high, and we can see all of those different symbols indicating how things are doing. Note that for each of those, there's this little summary blurb about uh, what the parameter or what the characteristic really means. And then also gives you that same information you saw before when I was um, uh, explaining what the status and the trend symbols really mean. And so there are actually a whole bunch of different parameters here. I don't have them all listed for you right here, but you can explore this on your own. But both chemical and physical parameters are included here, so you can explore a lot here. So of course, this is an especially valuable tool for us as a, a management agency to figure out where things are working and where things may not be. And so uh, one of the questions we ask is, how are we doing? And so we're zooming in now on an area, it's called the Tri-County Agricultural Area. And so we can see here, we're still on total phosphorus. We can see here that there are a bunch of locations here where the phosphorus is relatively high and in some cases it's actually increasing. And so we as an agency acknowledge that that could be problematic. It is an agricultural area. And so we have adopted various um, tools to try to approach that. And one of the big things that we've done is we've established uh, uh, quite a few cost share projects in that area. We have a, an active partnership with a number of other agencies and groups. And amongst all of those partners, $19.6 million has been spent to date for both water quality and water supply projects. So for example, over 7,000 acres have been converted to this uh, more efficient irrigation like this irrigation tile drainage system that's illustrated here. And so what's really advantageous about this is that installing this tube system with this structure for water control ends up raising the water table up so it gets the water closer to the roots and it ends up it's basically a twofer. It allows us to um, improve things from a water supply perspective and a, a water quality perspective because we're reducing the water use and we're reducing the amount of nutrient runoff. So this is a really wonderful cooperative partnership that's in place that has, is really benefiting our water systems. One more project to uh, mention, and this is really a hot topic for us because it's actually, um, it's just come, on last, come, come online last week, which is really exciting, which is the Doctors Lake Phosphorus Removal Pilot Project. So it's sited at Clay County Utility Authority's Fleming Island Regional Wastewater Plant, and this is specifically to tackle the issues that we're seeing related to algal blooms in Doctors Lake. We really believe we need to reduce the nutrient load into the lake. And one of the places that we think that that can be done is at this location where, we're, where we improve 
the quality of the treated wastewater by running this wastewater through this, uh, this engineered media mixed with wetland plants uh, that basically allows the water to trickle through and the, the, the phosphorus gets taken up and we expect to see a 90% phosphorus reduction uh, in the water that gets released and then gets applied in irrigation to local, um, by local residents. So that's another one of our really neat projects. We have quite a few other projects. I need this to advance. There we go. Um, oop, it went too far. Um, uh, we have a lot of other projects. I'm not going to go into detail on any of these, but we do have information on our website about uh, many of these projects. And then lastly, uh, we have a list of additional resources here for those of you who are interested in exploring what we and other agencies are doing. Our email address is listed there, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret for that great presentation about water quality. Uh, one of the questions that came in is for those individuals and, and for um, each of us, what is the best way for us um, as individuals to reduce our impacts on water quality? You know, I, I always think that one of the biggest things that we need to do is um, become as informed as we can about what the issues are and how we may be able to change. And I really find that um, the, the district's resources in this additional resources location here um, can be incredibly beneficial. It, it can help you um, explore how you may be able to make changes related to um, your, your managing your own property and managing your own impact. Um, what are some of the connections between um, in thinking about those nutrients that are available in our waters for algal blooms and potentially vegetation that might be killed along the banks of our um, stormwater ponds or vegetation that's making it into those stormwater systems? How would that impact water quality? So, so you're saying that if there's loss of vegetation, Right. Along the edges, yeah. So, so one of the challenges there is that um, a lot of that vegetation can really help as um, essentially as a filter for a lot of those nutrients. And so, when we have loss of vegetation, that can end up we can end up with uh, more nutrients than um, than desirable entering into a system that can then lead to algal blooms under certain conditions. Um, there was also a question about is the toil tile drain method also used for stormwater management as well? I am unsure of the answer to that. I know it's very heavily used in ag agriculture, but I do not know the answer to that question. And I'm more than happy to, to find out the answer and respond to that um, question later. Okay. Um, and then I'm trying to... to So what are um, some of those other solutions um, that you had, had mentioned that are some of those projects that the district is working on to um, address some of the algal bloom problems? That is, is one that, that folks wanted to hear a little bit of elaboration on. Okay, well, I, um, the, perhaps that question came about before I mentioned that Doctors Lake one, because that's a really big one for us. Um, is is that kind of approach? Um, but we really have an interagency um, effort happening right now, where we're actually trying to improve our understanding of um, of what is impacting. Uh, the, the, the blooms themselves so that we can figure out where else we need to focus our efforts. Um, uh, there, there, uh, Dr. Marzolf may be available and I'm not sure if he's got uh, additional um, insight into this that he may want to add. Dr. Marzolf, you're unmuted if you have a, another idea about um, or thoughts about ways that we're addressing that algal bloom concerns in the, the, the river. I think Margaret hit it, the nail on the head. We're working with other agencies cooperatively to share data, share insights, to better understand the connections between hydrology, water quality, and other conditions that stimulate blooms and also are behind the water quality patterns we see. 
and once they are better understood, look at, okay, how do we address each of those underlying causes? Thank you. So then there is also one final question uh, right before we get done um, that discuss, uh, discusses um, utilizing that vegetation and the partnership that might be going on with the Department of uh, Transportation in moving away to, to ponds that have um, more vegetation along those. Do either of you have information about uh, a partnership that the district is working on with them? I do not. Okay. I do not either. Okay. Well, thank you all for your participation today. And um, please join us for next week's webinar about our natural systems, and you'll learn more about those. I appreciate your attending, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much, Margaret, and thank you so much, Eric, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.